Hi, I'm Micah Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. Our first segment is called Background Briefing. The first thing I've been thinking about is Iran and Iran's approach to the United States. Iran's FARS media has run a large story singing the praises of none other than John Bolton. John Bolton, of all people. I, too, was stunned as I read the piece. John Bolton is a hawk on all issues, especially on the Iranian issue. As President Trump's national security advisor, Bolton was the most vociferous of all hawks, constantly suggesting strikes and aggressive responses to Iranian hostility. None of this was new behavior or thinking. Bolton has been consistent throughout his entire career. And then he and President Trump had the parting of ways. And the John Bolton book, which he wrote, which was a tell-all book, uh, said it all. And now Iran is praising him. The reason is clear. In praising John Bolton, Iran is criticizing Donald Trump. There are rumors that President Trump wants to impose martial law. Bolton does not think that that would be a very good idea and made his comments public. Trump retorted in a tweet, of course, that Bolton is one of the dumbest people in Washington. Simple as that. Iran has been running with this martial law story and the uh, Trump-Bolton conflict. It proves a Machiavellian axiom. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Trump is an, Iran's enemy. Trump and Bolton are enemies. So Iran and Bolton are friends. It's simple math. There are many issues worthy of monitoring in the Middle East, and many of them involve, you guessed it, Iran. Over the past few years, the relationship between Qatar and Iran has been front burner issue for those of us watching, not just for me, but for anyone trying to predict the events of the region. Ever since Qatar sided with Iran, they have been on the outs with the Sunni Middle East. And Qatar is also paying the price in Western democracies. A report, let's say, for instance, by the British Cornerstone Institute reports that the United States no longer shares intel with Qatar for fear that it will be shared with Iran, and neither do Great Britain or France. What makes this change in policy even more interesting is that Qatar still hosts U.S. and British forces. And the al Oidi Air Base in Qatar is the largest single military installation in the entire Middle East. One of the reasons it is so large is that the base hosts both U.S. Air Force units and British Royal Air Force units, and also serves the very important headquarters of the United States Central Command. More evidence that Qatar has been distanced from the West is that they ran to Turkey and Iran to try to scuttle the deals other countries were making with Israel. Qatar, Turkey, and Iran are consolidating their relationship in the hope that they can become a strong front against the deals with Israel, all of which were sponsored by, you guessed it, the United States. It is assumed that Qatar has told the United States that they may not attack Iran from their territory. If that is true, and it probably is, it's clearly showing where Qatar stands on the world stage. And when you think about Iran, when you analyze Iran's place in the world today, it is impossible to ignore Iran's comrade in arms, Russia. Russia's ambassador to Israel said that Israel was the most destabilizing force in the region. Did you hear that? He said that Israel was even more destabilizing than Iran. Did you hear that? That's unbelievable. This week, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Levrov, called U.S. policy in the Middle East unconstructive. He was responding to a comment made by Mike Pompeo that Russia's Mideast policies were destabilizing. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo had declared that, quote, Russia continues to threaten Mediterranean stability using a variety of techniques to spread disinformation, undermine national sovereignty, and sow chaos. Conflict and division within countries throughout the region, unquote. Levrov's response was, quote, the U.S. practically bans all countries in the region from cooperating with Russia, whether in the military or technical fields, as well as on any other issue, unquote. Levrov's example was accurate. The U.S. has imposed sanctions on the Turkish defense industry because Turkey imported Russia S-400 missile defense systems, which 
is incompatible with NATO systems and could compromise the Western world. Turkey has denied the claims, saying it has no plans to integrate the Russian system into NATO. Well, of course not. Turkey's comments are irrelevant. Their promise not to integrate or share NATO material information and any military information with Russia is empty and very hard to believe. But what is most distressing is that this war of words between the United States and Russia has emerged. Iran continues to do things its own way, and that's the way they like it. It's according to their own agenda. That's Iran's method. They march, so to speak, to their own band and drummer, and they answer to no one other than their own leadership's whims and desires. Iran has announced that they are planning to build two brand new nuclear facilities. The announcement appears to be revenge for the assassination of the father of the Iranian nuclear weapons program, Moshe Vakasideh. Now, this is important because these new sites will be up and running within five months. It could change the entire nuclear game. The first site is a laboratory that will deal with uranium in metal form. It is a mechanism essential in the making of nuclear weapons. The lab will have a heavy water reactor that can accumulate plutonium in its spent fuel. Richard Johnson, the senior director for fuel cycle and verification of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, a non-profit organization, expressed his concern over Iran's plans when he said, and I'm quoting here, if either was to proceed, that is either site's, that would stand out as a major proliferation concern, unquote. This is a serious issue for the world. Iran has said that it will shut the new facilities down only if the United States re-enters the famous JCPOA, a.k.a. the nuke deal. Not content to leave it there, Iran is also planning to up their oil pumping production next year. As the beginning of the year of the Iranian year, which means March, Iranian leadership plans to increase production to 4.5 million barrels a day. This happens in two stages. Stage one will take place now and extends through the Biden inauguration. First, Iran will increase their oil production to 2.6 million barrels per day. In stage two, they will double that to 4.5 million. Impressive as those numbers are, the real increase will be increasing their oil input from their current production, which their numbers are to reach 2.6 million. According to Bloomberg, Iran now is producing only 133,000 barrels a day. To get to 2.3 is unbelievable. This plan was presented by Iranian oil minister Bijan Namar Zagne to the Iranian parliament recently. Oil is the most significant component of Iran's economy, if you didn't know. They need to pump their oil and to sell their oil. These past few years, the Iranian economy has been crippled it, will, it looks like it's on the mend, and their economy improves, so will Iran's threat, and so will their nuclear program. That's enough about Iran, for now at least. As always, I've been thinking about Israel too, about Israel, the Jewish state, and her relationship with Arab and Muslim countries. A series of questions is emerging about normalization deals between Israel and some Arab countries, like Sudan, let's say. Sudan has a nasty history of perpetrating terror and supporting terror. They have a terrible human rights record, and they have made some of the most extreme anti-Israel statements. Sudan has almost nothing to offer Israel. With that knowledge, it was not surprising to hear Sudan's foreign minister, Omar Kamar al-Din, being interviewed on al Haddad TV and saying that Sudan, quote, agreed to avoid a state of war with the Hebrew state, but we will not reach another state. In other words, a state of peace. As if that wasn't enough, he went on to say that, quote, there is no diplomatic representation, no chamber of commerce, and no cooperation between Israeli and Sudanese universities or companies. There are military factors that work together as far as we know. I have no further information on this matter. Everything that concerns the promotion of relations with Israel in the future depends on there being an agreement or agreements. And any such agreement will be presented to the Legislative Council that will be formed soon, unquote. Lovers and supporters of Israel have become almost giddy over all the normalization deals Israel has entered into. But we must not and cannot, should not lose sight of the truth. Normalization is normalization. Normalization is not peace.
Coming up next, points of view. First up is a column from AP that also ran on ABC and in Al Jazeera. I took the version, this version from Al Jazeera. The author asks a deeply troubling question as it highlights part of the problem in the relationship between the Palestinian leadership and Israel. The column is called Palestinians Left Waiting as Israel is Set to Deploy Vaccine. Subtitled, Israel will begin rolling out a major coronavirus vaccination campaign next week after the Prime Minister reached out personally to the head of a major drug company. It's written by Joseph Krauss and the Associated Press, and it appeared on December 17th, 2020. Krauss approaches all the important issues of the vaccine and speaks about the disparity between Israel and the Palestinians. Let's see what he thinks. This is how Krauss begins. Dateline Ramallah, West Bank. Israel will begin rolling out a major uh, coronavirus vaccination campaign next week after the Prime Minister reached out personally to the head of a major drug company. Millions of Palestinians living under Israeli control will have to wait much longer. Worldwide, rich nations are snatching up scarce supplies of the new vaccine as poor countries largely rely on the World Health Organization program that is yet to get off the ground. There are few places where the competition is playing out in closer proximity than Israel and the territories it has occupied for more than half a century. Next year could bring a sharp divergence in the trajectory of the pandemic, which until now has blithely ignored the national boundaries and political enmities of the Middle East. Israelis could soon return to normal life and an economic revival, even as the virus continues to menace Palestinian towns and villages just a few kilometers away. Krauss is correct. Israel is working hard to bring the COVID virus to a manageable level. And part of that means vaccines and vaccinations. It also means shutdowns and even closing the airport and forcing Israelis into 14 days of isolation in hotels. Mel Krauss explains that Israel has made plans securing the vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. He writes, quoting again, Israel reached an agreement with Pfizer, a pharmaceutical company, to supply 8 million doses of its newly approved vaccine, enough to cover nearly half of Israel's population of 9 million, since each person requires two doses. That came after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu personally reached out multiple times to Pfizer chief executive Albert Borla, boasting that at one point he was able to reach the CEO at 2 a.m. in the morning. Israel has mobile vaccination units and refrigerators that can keep the uh, Pfizer shots at the required 70 degrees Celsius, minus 94 Fahrenheit. It plans to begin vaccinations as soon as next week. With a capacity of more than 60,000 shots a day, Israel reached a separate agreement with Moderna earlier this month to purchase 6 million doses of its vaccine, enough for another 3 million Israelis. Now, uh, now here is the issue that Krauss presents. Israel is vaccinating Israeli citizens, but not Palestinians in the PA, he writes. Israel's vaccination campaign will include Jewish settlers living deep inside the West Bank, who are Israeli citizens, but not the territories 2.5 2.5 million Palestinians. They will have to wait for the cash-strapped Palestinian Authority, which administers parts of the occupied West Bank in accordance with the interim peace accords reached in the 1990s. Israel captured the West Bank and Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem, territories the Palestinians seek for their future state in the 1967 Mideast War. I need to interject here. In Interestingly, as of now, the PA, excluding Gaza, has had, in real numbers, very few cases of COVID deaths, and even cases, about 85,000 cases, and only 800 deaths. And and then Gaza, which is home to 2 million Palestinians, had 30,000 cases and 220 deaths. Israel is also faring well, but not that well. They have reported 350,000 cases, including more than 3,000 deaths. Krauss and others are asserting that it's Israel's responsibility to deliver the vaccine to the PA and to Gaza. He writes, Physicians for Human Rights Israel, a group that advocates for more equitable health care, says Israel has a legal obligation as an occupying power to purchase and distribute vaccine to the Palestinians. It says Israel must also ensure the vaccines don't meet its own safety uh, guidelines, like like the Russian shot, 
are not distributed in areas under its control. Israel still maintains control over many aspects of the Palestinian lives, whether checkpoints, importing goods, medication, and controlling the movement of people, said Gada Majdal, the director of the group's activities in the Palestinian authorities. The Palestinian health system, whether in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip, is in dire condition, mainly because of restrictions imposed by Israel, unquote. There's a serious question here. The most significant issue is to see and understand that indeed Israel is far more powerful and wealthier than the PA and Gaza. And after Israel's needs are completed, they should help those less fortunate, no doubt. But the problem is that the Palestinians have been contentious and even worse towards Israel. That is especially the case with Gaza, but also with the PA, who since the U.S. declaration recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital, they have been distant and removed and trying to sabotage Israel in the international arena. For humanitarian reasons, Israel should help, and I'm certain that they will, because that is what makes Israel so great and so special. But do not expect much, even a thanks from the PA or the international community. Next up is a column by Dimi Reader, and it was published in Newsweek on December 15th, 2020. It's entitled, The Abraham Accords Will Change Israel, Just Not in the Way You Think, and it's listed opinion. Dimi Reader is a senior editor at Newsweek. This is a very long and detailed piece. For a column, it's especially long. For a Newsweek piece, even more so. Its essence is that there are some very good and also bad parts of the Abraham Accords, and the Palestinians are going to be hurt. This is how Reader begins. There have been two principal progressive critiques of the so-called Abraham Accords, the spate of peace and normalization agreements between Israel and the growing number of majority Arab Muslim states. First is that these states have abandoned the Palestinian cause and have given up their leverage over Israel for tuppence. Second is that all the mean, all meaningless theater, Israel was never at war with any of these countries and has long enjoyed barely covert trade and or security cooperation with nearly all of them. Both criticisms only get it half right. This is indeed theater, but it's far from meaningless, far from giving up leverage on Israel. The signatories have increased there exponentially. Reader goes through the benefits Israel and the Gulf states will reap but not the Palestinians. He concludes, some of the newfound Israeli Arab amity is certainly vulnerable to uh, ricochets from the conflict. Imagine if in 20 years, the Gulf states find it convenient for whatever reason to close the, uh, the tap on Israeli trade and travel, say in response to yet another Gaza war. More importantly, there's a bigger realignment in play here. Pro-Israeli writers celebrated the collapse of the Arab-Palestinian solidarity this past year as the beginning of the end of the Arab-Israeli conflict, musing that perhaps there wasn't much of a conflict there to begin with. They're right. But the flip side of this is an inevitable refocusing of minds on the conflict that very much does exist, the Palestinian-Israeli one. The useless shell of a civilization, Arab-Israeli conflict, is beginning to be shed. The hard incandescent core of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is beginning to emerge. The move is from a geopolitical chessboard to an intimate and visceral struggle with a vastly different power balance and a vastly more existential stakes. The problem with Reader is the problem with many who blame Israel and others for the failure of the PA to have a creative, productive society. They blame others, but not Palestinian leadership. They do not blame the PA leadership who refused to participate in the process and actually tried at every angle and every opportunity to sabotage the deals. Instead of joining and building, they wanted to destroy the growth and the process of expanding markets and normalization and even peace. Coming up, commentary through cartoons where pictures tell the story. I want to show you five images today. The first is a wonderful play on the couch potato. COVID has had many deleterious effects on almost everyone in the world. Many of us, although not all, are less active and more sedentary, and to our distress, have become couch potatoes. This cartoon depicts runners set up for a race, a marathon. The banner at the starting line reads, first annual couch potato, 
0.0010K. And then you look further and discover that three steps forward, it's the finish line. Unfortunately, this describes so many of us. Next up is a funny critique of outdoor dining. Three people are sitting in the snow, around the table, under an umbrella. The snow is four feet high. The caption reads, welcome to New York, outdoor dining available. This is funny. It's a perfect depiction of the week when New York was hit by the surge of COVID and a huge snowstorm at the same time. Next up is a critique of the new Purell world we live in, a world in which countless times a day we clean our hands with the goop that is at least 60% high or higher in ethyl alcohol. The meme reads, never in my whole life would I imagine my hands would consume more alcohol than my mouth. Now, a strange take on our new world, where we wear masks, and where we take and share pictures of everything, on everything, all the time. We send them, we post them, we send them to our friends, our relatives. In this case, a woman wearing a mask is photographing a vanilla soft serve ice cream cone with her cell phone, and the caption reads, I would love to show someone from 1995 this picture and ask them what they think is happening here. What is so remarkable is that 1995 was only 25 years ago. Things have certainly changed. Last up is a tribute to 2020. Since September, people have been commenting about 2020 and how difficult a year it has been. Uh, that is an understatement. This meme says it all. A cake is cut. It's a chocolate cake, but it's in the shape of a toilet paper roll. The caption reads, ladies and gentlemen, I present you the official cake of 2020. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. But first, this piece is actually from Newsmax, and I find it fascinating and want to share it with you. Here we go. References to the Middle East dealings were reportedly removed from a website of a consulting firm linked to two officials picked for the top posts in Joe Biden's administration. The Washington Free Beacon said both Dennis McDonough Biden's pick to run the Department of Veterans Affairs, and Jake Sullivan, who Biden chose to be his national security advisor, had served as partners at Macro Advisory Partners. The Beacon described the company as a consulting firm that says it helps clients manage geopolitical risk. The firm, until early November, had touted its work helping a financial services company expand into the Middle East. According to the Beacon, which attributed its information to archived versions of the company's website, and the Beacon reported that the firm also said it helped clients manage the geopolitical economic volatility in the Middle East markets. Tom Anderson, the director of the National Legal Policy Center, a government watchdog group, said the deletion of information sparks questions about work that the Biden duo conducted. Quote, when politicians or officials are caught trying to hide something, there is a reason for their actions, he said, and continued. Usually, they see a bigger reward than the risks associated with scrubbing. Hiding motivations for seeking positions should raise red flags for oversight professionals and the media to expose potential conflicts of interest. Sullivan played a key role as the policy advisor in Hillary Clinton's presidential campaigns, no doubt there. McDonough was President Barack Obama's White House Chief of Staff. Macro advisory partners and Biden transition team did not respond to questions or comment, or comment as the Beacon reported. Now moving on. The Saudi State TV reported that Saudi-led coalition fighting in Yemen said it destroyed a marine mine laid by Iran-allied Houthis in the Southern Red Sea, and that that mine is Iranian made. This is significant because it means that Iran and the Houthis are no longer limiting their operations to in-person assaults. A marine mine is stationary and once placed will blow up when struck by a ship or a submarine. This is a game changer. We are being told that the recent massive hacking campaign disclosed by the United States was, that, uh, was the work of Russian government sponsored groups extended beyond users of the pervasive network software that had been compromised. The Department of Homeland Security reported that the spies 
had used other techniques besides corrupting the updates of network management software by Solar Winds, which is a company out of Texas. The software company ultimately is used by hundreds of thousands of companies and government agencies. SolarWinds Orion supply chain compromise is not the only initial infection vector this APT actor leveraged. The Department of Homeland Security's Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency referring to the advanced persistent threat as adversaries. We don't know the level of this hack and how far it's reached. What we do know is that it's very worrisome, extremely worrisome. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. We spent quite a significant amount of time speaking about and thinking about oil. Let's discuss where the word oil actually comes from. It's an interesting question. The etymology and the original derivation of words is critical. The first time it's found in the English language is in 1176. The word oil comes from the old French, oile, and from the Latin, oleum, which in turn comes from the Greek, eiulion, olive oil, or oil. It's referring only to olive oil at the time. In Hebrew, the word is shemen. Oil, olive oil is shemen zayat. It's one of the primary products of ancient Israel. It was produced during the biblical period, during the second temple period, and during the rabbinic period, three great periods of Israel. Of course, oil was also used in Jewish ritual. We have evidence that oil was made in Palestine and Israel. It was so good, it was exported to what is now called Italy and Greece. And in return, the same ships came back with their wine. Israel's wine was just average, but its olive oil was world class. Today, Israel produces exceptional olive oils and wines. In the very same fields that have been growing grapes for thousands of years, many olive trees are hundreds of years old. Even several are as old as 1,600 years. That is truly remarkable. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Mike Alpern. Let's think out loud again next week on JBS. <laughs>